The third gospel reading, which provides the text for the sermon, is Mark 1, 14 through 20. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. And all of God's people said, Amen. Over the past four weeks, we have been centered in the prologue of the Gospel of John, pondering the powerful poetic language and the deep theological richness that we find there. In the beginning was the Word. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. And through his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. We spent four weeks unpacking these 18 verses, and we just scratched the surface of all of the deep and rich wisdom God has for us there. And I know I'm a card-carrying Bible nerd, but I could spend months in John's prologue and not get enough. So now get ready for a little bit of whiplash, because here's Mark. Jumping right in the deep end with verse 1. No preamble, no poetry, no beautiful birth story, no genealogy, just bam. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, Son of God. And then comes Isaiah's prepare the way of the Lord, and then John the baptizer shows up to tell everyone the Messiah is coming and get ready. And then next, John's baptizing Jesus. And then the Spirit immediately drove Jesus out into the wilderness for 40 days of temptation. That's a lot of action for just the first 13 verses. In fact, Mark uses the word euthus, or immediately, 42 times in his 16-chapter gospel. And yet, Mark isn't using immediately in the way most of us use it, in terms of things happening quickly according to our human measurements of time, like watches and calendars. It's not that kind of immediately. When Jesus preaches the good news of God saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near in verses 14 and 15, Jesus isn't talking about clock time or chronos in Greek, which is where we get our word chronological. He's not talking about that. Jesus is talking about Kairos time, meaning the right time or the crucial moment. Kairos time is God's timing. One way I like to think about Kronos versus Kairos time shows up in old cookbooks, the kind with recipes that say you'll need a palm full of flour or a pinch of salt or my favorite, cook till done. What does that mean? How do I know it's done? Recently, I was making something and the recipe said, bake in a medium hot oven until golden brown at the edges. It was cornbread, golden brown at the edges. That's kind of like Kairos time. Kronos time would say, bake at 350 degrees for 30 minutes. And that's all you'd get. That's much more precise, right? 350 degrees for 30 minutes. But it doesn't always work out right. 
For example, our current oven that we have in our home is what my mama used to call a cold oven. I can bake the biscuits at 350 degrees for 30 minutes and they are not going to be done. They are not going to be golden brown on top and still a little bit tender in the middle like we like them. So if you're baking biscuits in our oven, you have to use Kairos time. You just have to watch and wait for that right moment to pull them out and serve them hot with butter. According to God's Kairos timing, the time is right for Jesus to begin the ministry that's going to change the world. Mark diving right in at the beginning and his consistent use of immediately isn't about the rushed human-sized pressure of Kronos time, but the urgency and intentionality of God's timing. Now is the time, Jesus announces, and that is good news. It's urgent good news for us. Jesus starts preaching like a spiritual alarm clock urging all who hear his voice to wake up. Pay attention. The good news of God is here. Repent and believe. And so, God the Son interrupts life as usual in first century Galilee. In Jesus, the kingdom of God breaks into Kronos time. A kingdom so completely different from the world that we know, so compelling that it stirs a response, which Jesus outlines in his one-sentence sermon, the kingdom of God has come near, repent, repent, and believe in the good news. Note the order. God acts first interrupting us with the kingdom of God embodied in Jesus. And then comes the call for a human response. Repent and believe. Now, repent is one of those words that I think is too often layered with negative understanding, baggage, if you will. Repent simply means in the Hebrew to turn around or to return. In the Greek, it's metanoia, one of my favorite Greek words, which means a change of mind and heart. So repent isn't a negative word at all. It's actually positive. Think the prodigal son turning around out of that pigsty to come home with a complete change of mind and heart, welcomed back into the fold. Think of that moment when you're driving around lost and you have no idea where you are and suddenly you recognize something and you turn around towards home on the right road this time. That's repentance. What good news. We get to turn around when we're going the wrong way, either the big wrong way or a little wrong way, the kind we do every day. The opportunity is always there to turn around. And even better, the one who's calling us to turn around is ready to welcome us and show us the way back. Jesus shows up in a whole new way of being in and living in the world is made possible. It's the best kind of interruption and only the start. In the very next verse, Jesus interrupts the lives of two fishing brothers. Simon and Andrew are in the midst of their everyday life, surrounded by familiar faces and familiar work, everything right on Kronos time. Jesus sees them casting their nets into the Sea of Galilee, and he calls out to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. That's it. Jesus simply shows up and calls them to follow him, and they do. Mark says, and immediately they left their nets and followed him. 
There's that kairos immediately again. Again, God's timing breaking into our human routines and expectations, our small chronos time certainties with a whole new reality. As only a savior could, Jesus sees Simon and Andrew and he knows the time is ripe for them. He calls out, interrupting the life that they know, and they respond. They turn and step into Kairos time with Jesus, kingdom of God time, the best kind of interruption, and only the start. Together, Jesus leading the way, Simon and Andrew, they all walk together along the shore of the Galilee, Sea of Galilee, and Jesus spots another set of fishing brothers, James and John, sons of Zebedee. These two are in a boat, mending their nets, one of those chronos maintenance tasks that fishermen have to do to keep the business going. You can't catch fish with torn nets. And so there they are, doing the work of their livelihood, absorbed in the moment, necessary chronos time business. And then Jesus interrupts, calling to James and John, and they follow too, leaving their poor father Zebedee just sitting in the boat with the hired men. Hearing Jesus' voice, James and John respond to the kairos timing of God. Quite literally, they turn around from what they likely assumed they would be doing for the rest of their lives, just to follow Jesus. God's timing, life interrupted, the best kind of interruption and only the start. Now, another thing that Jesus is interrupting here that's not quite as obvious is the way that teachers of the day gathered disciples around them. Honestly, he's kind of doing it all wrong. As preacher Barbara Brown Taylor explains, rabbis didn't seek students. Students sought rabbis. Teachers waited for people to come to them, and they interviewed them carefully before deciding to take them on as disciples. Only the most promising students were allowed to stay on, the ones who showed real aptitude for theology. No self-respecting rabbi would have gone out to recruit his own followers, and if he had, he probably wouldn't have picked the first four people that he saw. From the very beginning moments of his ministry, Jesus is interrupting the norms of our chronos organized world and does things in time with his own kingdom, not the kingdoms of this world who think they have all the answers. He's not looking for polished and impressive people, high achievers, organized movers and shakers, or even the most religious people who have all, again, the right answers. This scene isn't about the four fabulous fishermen. This scene is about our amazing God who interrupts the most ordinary people living the most ordinary lives and claims them summons them, follow me, and bless their hearts. They do. They do follow him, having no idea how often he's going to keep interrupting their idea of how the ways of things should go. He's going to keep interrupting their chronos expectations and sensibilities. Every miracle, every teaching, every sermon, every conversation, turning them farther and farther from that chronos life and more and more into the kairos life of the kingdom of God. And they are different. Here's the thing, 
In the kingdom, God interruptions are the norm, not the exception. You've heard me mention before, being the nerd that I am, that in Greek, there's a little tick in the present tense that we don't have in English. To follow in Greek means, in the present tense, to follow and to keep following. That's understood. It's not a one-time thing, to follow and to keep following. Continuous action is implied. It's like there's a little dab of future in the present. Follow me and keep following me is what Jesus is saying to the four fishermen and to us. And when we keep following, interruptions are going to keep happening. And if they're not, it means we aren't paying attention. Not long ago, a ministry colleague of mine experienced this continuous interruptive action of following Jesus. Peggy is one of my go-to people for perspective and wisdom. She's a therapist and a chaplain and a writer and speaker and blogger. As a part-time chaplain at a medical center that's part of a much larger system, she serves staff and patients and families wherever and however she happens to meet them. Spiritual care is not just Peggy's gift, it's her jam, it gives her life. Oh, that we could all have a chaplain like Peggy. But then God interrupted. Peggy writes, in the late summer, I had two weeks in a row where while working in my yard, my feet flew out from under me. One time, it's a funny story. Twice, it's an invitation to start listening and paying attention. You see, Peggy's an accomplished triathlete. Her feet don't just fly out from under her, not usually, and certainly not twice in a row. After some prayer and reflection, Peggy started to sense that God was trying to get her attention, shifting something within her, interrupting her. And she started to sense that that shift might have something to do with her work. And then she said, came the vision board. A vision board is just a practice of making a collage where you're thinking about the future and what God might do and, and how you're feeling called to live. And she said they were in a spiritual care departmental meeting for the whole system back in the fall. And as part of that meeting, they were supposed to create a vision board of how they were envisioning this next stage of their ministry in the healthcare system. And she says, I love doing collages and vision boards and all that stuff. But I struggled with this one because I couldn't put myself in the picture. No matter how hard I tried, I wasn't a part of it. It was so absolutely clear to me and frustrating to me. I wasn't part of the vision. So it seemed that God was letting Peggy know that her ministry there at that particular place in that particular time was coming to a close. And she says that even after the clarity of that vision board experience, she still wasn't quite convinced. She felt like maybe she still had a little wiggle room and convince God that he had this all wrong. She says, I tried to do a lot of convincing of God, who I apparently thought was clueless as to what was going on down here, that a healthcare team in the middle of a pandemic needs their chaplain. But over and over again, in a half a dozen ways, God said to Peggy, go. And that's the thing that happens when we open ourselves up to God's interruptions, when we listen. She says, we can't control what comes next. All we can control is how we respond. God's interruption of Peggy's life came just as abruptly as God's interruption in the lives of those four fishermen. 
Those brothers were doing their Kronos time thing, living their lives, probably doing it well. For Peggy, it started with two falls in a row doing yard work, leading her to ask, wait, what's up? which then led to serious prayer and reflection and then led to the vision board aha moment and then more discernment but the interrupting god was not going to stop interrupting there's a reason a poet once called jesus the hound of heaven he will not let you go over time god's interruption eventually unfolded into peace for Peggy. And she concluded in her last week at the hospital. Over the last week, I've had several medical team members tell me, you spoil us, which makes my heart glad, she said, because it's what I wanted to do to take care of the folks who take care of us. It makes me glad to hear that, and it makes it hard to leave. And yet at the same time, I have absolute peace. Getting interrupted by God can be uncomfortable and mystifying and disorienting. But if we're going to follow Jesus and keep following Jesus, then God interruptions are going to happen and must happen because our God loves us too much not to interrupt our small chrono schedules and expectations and assumptions and to leave us stuck in our own grooves that we're absolutely sure are the right way and the way that things have always been. Because if we're stuck in chronos time, that's all we can see. And it's hard. It's hard when those interruptions happen because it is one more reminder we are not in control no matter how much we wish we were. When Kairos time breaks into our little worlds, all we can do is respond. Sure, we can always pull a Jonah and run in the other direction, but even in the belly of a whale, our God does not give up. In my own life and in 25 years of ministry experience, it strikes me that the biggest struggle we have when God interrupts us is resisting the interruption. We tie ourselves up in knots in order not to hear, not to follow, to convince God that he's got it all wrong. Sisters and brothers, following Jesus may not be easy, but doing so ultimately brings a peace that the world cannot give, and chronos time expectations cannot give. The God interruptions in this passage and in our lives are ultimately good news. This pandemic, our political turmoil, and our national racial reckoning. Sometimes it feels like our feet are flying out from under us and we're here flat on our backs, looking up at the sky and wondering, okay, God, what's up? What do we need to hear? Now, to be absolutely crystal clear, I do not believe God caused this pandemic or that God is responsible for our political turmoil or the racial pain in our country. None of the, these three issues are good news on their own, and all three are thorny and complex and hard. But at the same time, all three are also God interruptions compelling us to turn, turn around, and listen close for Jesus' voice summoning us to follow him and to keep following him. We worship an interrupting God, and our work is to respond, and by his grace to listen and to follow and to keep following. Again, there will always be the temptation to resist. I have nothing to hear. I have nothing to learn. And I'm following along just fine, thank you very much. 
No thanks, Jesus. I'll just stay right here in this boat where I am happy and I'll mend my nets and focus on this right now. Thanks so much for asking. And in that insistence, we are missing the giant spiritual alarm clock that our resistance is showing us. God's already interrupting. Are we listening? Are we willing to follow and to keep following? Resistance mode is natural humanity, but it sure does keep us stuck not growing, not following, and missing out on all God has for us and all the new ways God could be using us. Sisters and brothers, hear the good news. The kingdom of God has come near in Jesus Christ, and while we live in between his first coming and his second, we are in a constant state of following and continuing to follow, repenting and turning around when we've resisted his call. The hound of heaven is not going to give up on us, will never leave us or forsake us. So let us keep following, let us keep growing and learning, let us be interruptible. Fifth Avenue Baptist Church, may it be said of us, and immediately they left their nets, their assumptions, their Kronos life certainties, and followed him. Amen.